Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> good to see you. My name is Luke. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I'm eager to open God's Word together today. Uh, you know, there's a very famous song. I'm wondering if you can figure out what song this is. It's a song that is performed an estimated 10 million times per year. It's been sung by uh, a wide range of artists, Joan Baez, Aretha Franklin, Johnny Cash, Elvis, Willie Nelson, Destiny's Child, you didn't see that one coming, uh, Carrie Underwood, Dropkick Murphys, any Dropkick Murphys fans in the house, uh, they perform this song, and you too. This is a song that has appeared on The Simpsons, on Star Trek, in Superman comics, and it was part of Woodstock. What is this song? Any guesses? Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. One of the most famous songs ever, Amazing Grace. And uh, you may know it was written by John Newton. And what made John Newton uh, especially interesting as the author of that song is that John Newton had infamously been a captain of a slave ship. So he had been part of participating in the African slave trade when he met Christ and his life was changed. Here's actually what it says on John Newton's gravestone. It says, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. The lesson of John Newton's life is the same lesson as this story we're going to look at here today, and it's this. It's never too late to change. Oh, man, isn't that good news today? It is never too late to change. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It's never too late to change. And wherever you're at and whatever you're coming from and whatever you believe or you don't believe, here's what I want to tell you today. It's never too late to change. Whether you aren't a Christian, maybe today is a day where you go, you know what? God might even forgive and welcome me. Maybe you are a Christian, you've been a Christian for a long time, but you've experienced defeat and setback and sin. It's never too late to change. That's what we're going to look at in this story. Just to catch you up on this, we're wrapping up the series we began at the very beginning of the year uh, in the book of Genesis. We're near the end, and we've said that this last part of Genesis would make a really great limited edition like Netflix series or TV series, right? So to catch you up, right? Previously on the Sons of Jacob. Uh, Episode one was uh, Joseph, the 11th of Jacob's 12 sons. Joseph has these two pretty powerful dreams. And in both of these dreams, his family members are bowing themselves down before him. Now he's foolish and it seems like a little bit arrogant. And so he tells everybody about the dream and they already don't like him because he's their dad's favorite. And so when given the opportunity that first they're going to kill him. And then it's actually Judah, one of his older brothers who says, Hey, 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 let's don't kill him. Let's make money off of it. And Judah sell Judah and the brothers sell Joseph into slavery in Egypt. That was episode one. Episode two was this contrast between Judah and Jacob. You see this contrast in their character. Judah, whose idea it was to sell his brother, you see is a scoundrel. And he's going down this hole of his own making. But all he cares about is not righteousness. He actually just cares about his reputation. In contrast to Joseph, and Joseph is doing what's right, and Joseph is obeying the Lord, but things just keep getting worse for him, and uh, he's going down a hole, not of his own making, but just of God's providence, and yet still he's holding fast and he's trusting God. That was episode two. Episode three, which we looked at last week, was a little bit of a break in the Judah-Joseph drama uh, to just show how deeply the hole Joseph was going into was, and so we looked at last week what happens when we feel forgotten by a faithful God, and how no matter what what Joseph does that is right. It seems like things are just not going his way, that we follow the Lord into death while we in hope wait for him to bring resurrection. In fact, that's what happens. And so at the end of the chapter, uh, Joseph has risen to power. He's come up with this plan because there were going to be seven years of uh, plenty followed by seven years of famine. We're now in the beginning of that seven years of famine. And the famine is stretching out, not just in Egypt, but around the whole earth, which is why at the end of chapter 41, it says, Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. So those are what we've looked at. Today's episode four, it's never too late to change. We're going to see some pretty cool change in this story. Joseph is going to lose his arrogance. Jacob, the patriarch, is going to lose his idolatry. Judah, the scoundrel who's only in it for himself, is going to lose his self-preservation. 
And so the way I want to approach this is I want to just teach through this. So you're going to need a Bible. You're, you're not going to track with this very well unless you have a Bible in your hand. Uh, by the way, I don't think we've ever, I don't know how much if we've ever explained this. The reason we don't put the verses on the screen is because we want you to have a Bible in your hand. So reach under the seats in front of you, grab a Bible or pull it up on your phone. We're going to go today through basically 42, uh, talking about through 46. And I'm just going to teach through it and then occasionally pause. There's really four key lessons that we're going to see as we go through it uh, together today. So that's where we're headed. You ready? I'll tell you, hey, uh, this is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. It's genius. It's brilliant. Uh, It's really, really good. I don't know that I can communicate it very well, but it's a great story. All right, let's pray and ask God's help. Father, would you speak to us today? Would you encourage us in whatever areas we need to change that it's not too late? God, pour out your amazing grace on me as I preach, on us as we hear your word. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you got your Bible, Genesis 42, verse 1. It says this, when Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you look at one another? Somebody do something. We got to do something here, guys. Don't stand around. These are all grown men, by the way, these, these uh, sons of Jacob. And he said, behold, I've heard there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. That just, that's really interesting, right? Because if, if Benjamin goes, that's one more person who can get more grain. He says, rather than have more grain, I'm going to leave him back with me because he fears something's going to happen to him. Maybe he doesn't trust his sons. Maybe he doesn't quite buy the story they made about that Joseph had been attacked by a wild animal. Maybe We don't know, but he's, he's going, maybe he goes, hey, these guys are just as big a scoundrels as I am. But whatever the reason, he holds him back. It says, so they came to buy this food. Verse six, now Joseph was governor over all the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? He said, they said from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. Now this is just amazing because, because we're thinking like, wow, what a surprise. Like these guys haven't seen each other in years. They clearly don't even recognize uh, Joseph. It's in the last chapter. He had shaved. He, you know, he just looked like a totally different person. It's been more than 22 years. It's been a long time. Uh, they, they, there's just no way they expect this, but you almost get a sense. I mean, and I'm reading a little bit between the lines, but I kind of wonder if, if Joseph's actually not that surprised. There was a little tidbit in last week's chapter where uh, Joseph is telling Pharaoh about the dreams he had. And he said, hey, Pharaoh, um, you had two of these dreams, which what that means is this is definitely going to happen. And if you remember back at the very beginning, what happened was Joseph had had how many dreams about his brothers bowing down? Two. And so I just can't help but wonder, was Joseph going like, hey, it's not a question of if they're going to come, it's when. And so he sees them, they're bowing down before him in verse six, but he realizes this isn't the full picture. The full picture was all of his brothers. The full picture was all of his family and it's not quite there. And so Joseph remembers that and he's like, this isn't quite the picture. God's still gonna do something. We gotta, we, we, let, let's see what happens. And so the strategy begins. In the middle of verse nine, here's how he says, he speaks to them. Again, they don't recognize him. He says, you are spies and you've come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's been the moral of this story so far. The honest sons of Jacob. That's not the name of the TV show, okay? We're honest men. Your servants have never been spies. He said to them, no, it is the nakedness of the land that you've come to see. And they said, we, your servants, are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. What was that like to hear? 
But Joseph said to them, it is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested whether there's truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. So if you're tracking with this plan, he's saying, all right, here's what's going to happen. One of you is going to go get your little brother. The rest of you I'm keeping here in custody. They're there for three days going, oh no, this is not good. This is a problem. It doesn't quite turn out that way. Look at verse 18. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your household and bring your youngest brother to me. So your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. So the, the, he, he eases up, right? He puts the pressure on him, but then he, he lets him off the hook a bit and he just keeps one of them back. But look at their response in verse 21. Then they said to one another, this is them speaking Hebrew with just one another. They said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother and that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? What a firstborn, huh? Didn't I tell you guys? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. 22 years have passed. And right away, oh, this is because of that thing we did. They've been plagued by guilt for 22 years. And they should. Some of you are plagued. That decision you made, that thing you did, that thing you should have done that you didn't do, and anytime anything happens, it's like, it's because of that. That's exactly where they were. But you see, Joseph, his heart's not hard to them. Look at verse 24. Then he turned away from them and wept. He sees they're beginning to change. They're beginning to soften. And he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from them. By the way, Simeon's the second son. <laughs> Reuben's off the hook. You know, he did speak up for me. Uh, Simeon is bound before their eyes. And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. This was done for them. Then they loaded up their donkeys with their grain and departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of the sack. He said to his brother, my money's been put back. Here it is in the mouth of the sack. At this, their hearts failed them. And they turned trembling to one another saying, what is this that God has done to us? Right, get it. They, they, he gave them all the grain. Here's all the grain. But he, he didn't accept their money. He put it back. And they're like, oh no, they're going to think we stole this. What has God done? Now, here's the first lesson we've got to see is the agents of change. The agents of change. And the agents of change in this story is what one commentator calls frost and sun. Toughness and tenderness. It, it's kind of confusing when you first are reading this story because Joseph's been this man of God. Joseph's been this man of faith. And yet it seems at the surface like he sees his brothers and he's just vindictive and he's just mean. And you guys are spies and I'm putting you in prison. And he speaks harshly to them. And, and so it seems like, oh, maybe this is Joseph going to finally get his revenge. Is that what's going on? Well, no, because there's not just frost, like the hard things, the cold things, the tough things, the bitter things, but there's also sun, right? You'll see, you, you saw it once, you're going to see it throughout the story, that repeatedly he's running out of the room weeping. His heart is soft. His heart is broken. He, he feels compassion toward these guys, right? He, he, he gives them the frost of you're all going to be in prison, but then he gives them the sun of, well, you know, just one of you. And, and he gives all their money back so that right, he, he wants his father and their family to be able to have food. That's why he sends them all back. He wants them to be able to keep having the money. So it's this combination of frost and sun, of toughness and tenderness. And this is the agent that God often uses to bring change in our lives. When it's all sun, we don't ever feel the consequences of our sin. When it's all warm and it's all soft and it's all awesome, like we don't ever go, oh man, this is what I've done. But you notice they start to be changed by going, this is because of what we did. What is God doing to us? Right? What gets their attention is the discipline. This is not retribution. 
right? Retribution is like quid pro quo, this for that, you did that, so I'm going to do this. This is not retribution. This is more like fatherly discipline. And the scripture tells us that God disciplines his children, that if you aren't experiencing at some point the frost and sun from God, the discipline from God, then you're actually not one of his legitimate children. And this makes sense. Like, I, I love kids. I, I love uh, the, we have like 400 or so kids most weeks running around here with their snotty noses and messy fingers getting all over the windows. And, and every time I see it, I was like, this is why we created it. This is why we built this thing. Like, I love one of my favorite things is seeing kids run in church. All right? How many of you like don't run? This is God's house. No, this is a fun place. Run. Just try to be faster than your friends. Go, go, go. Like, like I, I love kids, but, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not, dis- I love when my, ki- when my kids have their friends over. Like, I love that. But when that happens, I'm not disciplining those kids. They're not my kids. My job is to discipline my kids, and I love my kids enough to discipline them because discipline is saying, I'm not going to allow you to continue to be a fool. I'm not going to continue to allow you to hurt yourself. I love you too much. I'm going to, at times, have to be tough. And after that discipline, listen, get in here, and I'm hugging your neck. Because there's frost and there's sun. That's the agent of change. You're going to see this strategy just keep coming up throughout the story, but I wanted to point it out and make sure we're, uh, we're able to notice it. So that's the first thing we see is the agents of change or frost and sun. So they're freaking out. What has God done to us? Uh, they get back to Jacob and they tell him, here's everything that happened. Um, you know, hey, we can't go back there unless we bring Benjamin with us. Like this seems difficult. Then verse 35, jump down to verse 35. It says, as they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you would take Benjamin? All of this has come against me. It is a very selfish way to experience this. Reuben said to his father, verse 37, Reuben said, kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. And those kids are like, wait, what? What do we do? Like, what do we do? Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. But he said, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he is the only one left. Every son wants to feel connected to the heart of his father. Imagine hearing that. Right, Benjamin and Joseph were the two sons of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. He's the only one left. That's, that's language of idolatry. He's the only thing I have. He's the only thing. It's clutching. It's clinging. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, I would rather we all die than Benjamin die because I'm not letting you go back. I'll trade Simeon. Simeon, you stay in prison, but you can't have Benjamin. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. So that's chapter 42. Chapter 43, uh, the the famine, right? They run out of the food that they had. And it's like, hey, we got to go back. Joseph, or Jacob's like, we got to go back. And they start to go, well, dad, here's the problem. We got to take Benjamin. If we take, if we don't take Benjamin, the guy was really clear with us. He's not giving us anything. We got to take him. And here's what Judah says, verse 8. This transformation that's beginning in Judah. Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me and we will arise and go that we may live and die, both we and you and our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever, right? Reuben puts his kids on the line. Judah's like, put me on the line. I'll be his pledge. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of him. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bag and carry a present down to the man, a little balm and a little honey, gum, myrrh. Who doesn't like gum? Pistachio nuts, almonds, right? This is Jacob's go-to move, right? This is what he did with Esau. Hey, send him a big gift package, you know, gift basket to butter him up a little bit. Take double the money with you, verse 12. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. 
And take also your brother and arise, go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back your brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. We look first at how frost and sun are the agents of change. Now we see the second lesson is that the sign of change is letting idols go. Right, Jacob's been clutching. Jacob's been clinging. If, if I lose my son, I'm nothing. And now, finally, something happens. The sign, the change is taking place is verse 14. This is remarkable. May God Almighty, he remembers, he names God Almighty. He's going, oh yeah, this is the one who showed up to me with the, the ladder up to heaven. This is the one who I wrestled with. This is the one who promised me that he would fulfill the promises that he made to my father and my grandfather. This is the one, he's God Almighty. Oh yeah, my life is in his hands. May God Almighty, verse 14, grant you mercy before the man. He goes, oh yeah, God's a God of mercy. My name was Jacob, deceiver, and he changed it to Israel, struggles with God. Oh yeah, he's a God of mercy. And then finally, this last statement, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. I trust God. I'm going to put it in his hands, come what may. Well, things Seth and I talk a lot about, and Matthew, as we try to lead the staff here, is, is the different kinds of delegation, right? Those of you in different organizations, you, you think about the things you can delegate, right? There's at least three things you can delegate. You can delegate tasks, like, hey, here's exactly what I want you to go do, but you go do it, right? That's one way to delegate. A second thing to delegate is you can delegate responsibility. Like, hey, listen, you figure out the tasks. I don't know exactly what they should be, but this is up to you. You're responsible for this outcome, but how you get there, that's up to you. You delegate tasks or responsibility. The best thing to delegate is anxiety. Hey, listen, you are so in charge of this that I'm not going to think about it anymore. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. You need to feel the anxiety of this. You need to worry about this. I'm handing the anxiety to you. Let me ask you this. What if you handed your anxiety to God? Say, so God, you're God Almighty. You're merciful. Fear. What if you let go? See, sometimes, like in this case, the only way to save Benjamin is to let him go. Right? Because if he clutches him, then they're all going to die of famine. The only way to save Benjamin is to let him go and to trust the Lord with him. Maybe there's something that God is inviting you, or maybe there's someone that God is inviting you in this season to say, hey, let him go. That's the sign of change. So they head down. Uh, they uh, begin to do this. It says, verse 15, so the men took this present and they took double the money with them. And Benjamin, they arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready for the men are to dine with me at noon. And uh, this actually freaks the guys out. They're like, you know, they tell them, hey, uh, the, the head guy wants to have you to his house. And they're like, oh no, this is because we, you know, they think we stole the money, right? Because remember they had all the money back in their sack. So they go to the like chief of staff that works under Joseph. And they're like, hey, just so you know, when we got home, all the money was in our sacks, but we swear we didn't do it. Like, and the guy's like, no, 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 I got your money. You're fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, just, you know, go, go to lunch with this guy. So here's what it says, verse 26. When Joseph came home, just imagine the drama of this scene. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present they had with them. Here's your gift basket, Mr. Scary Egyptian guy, sir. And they bowed down to him to the ground. Oh, there it is. We're getting closer to the dream being fulfilled. And he inquired about their welfare and said, is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, your servant, our father, as well. He's still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and he saw his brother, Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. 
Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep, and he entered his chamber and wept there. Right? He's like, I, excuse me, I got to get out, and he goes in private and he cries. Then he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, serve the food. They served him by himself and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews. So it seems like the Egyptians are in one room, and Joseph is in one room with his brothers at separate tables. And then look at how the seating is arranged, right? They're like, here's, here's where we want you to sit. All the place cards are there. Verse 33, and they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth, right? They're seated from oldest to youngest, right? Like you imagine the picture is like, you know, I mean, they're all grown men, I guess, but you get the idea. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. Now this, five times as much, what is he doing? Is this just Joseph doing what his father did, right? Practicing all this favoritism? No, this is part of the strategy. What is Joseph doing? He is trying to recreate in his brothers the opportunity for them to be jealous of Benjamin like they were jealous of him. Remember, his father doted on him, and he's trying to give them the opportunity to demonstrate that they've changed. This is a little bit, it actually reminds me, in the New Testament, this is a little bit like Jesus with Peter. You know, Peter, on the night that Jesus was crucified, the, day, the night before Jesus was crucified, Peter denied Jesus three times. And it's after that that Jesus recreates the scene. It says he has a charcoal fire, which is the same kind of fire that Peter was warming his hands with while he denied him. And Jesus is cooking breakfast over the charcoal fire. And three times he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And Peter gets exasperated like, Lord, you know that I love you. What? And, and what Jesus is doing is he's giving Peter a chance to fully redeem himself. To fully experience that, yeah, I'm a different person. That's exactly what Joseph's doing. So he gives Benjamin this huge portion. And then he ramps it up even more. Look at chapter 44, verse 1. Then he commanded the steward of his house, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest with his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph said. So, so they fill every bag up with the grain. They give them all their money back again. <laughs> They're not going to like that. And then they put the cup, the silver cup, expensive silver cup in the, in the sack of Benjamin's stuff. Verse three, and as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, up, follow after the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? Is, not this, is it not from this that my Lord drinks and by this that he practices divination? You've done evil in doing this. By the way, the, the practicing divination, he, he's saying, just, just tell him that. I, I don't know that Joseph practiced divination. There's no other part of the story that makes you think that he did. But they would have totally thought that an Egyptian important person would have practiced divination. So this just seems like, hey, ramp up the tension, ramp up the drama. When he overtook them, he spoke to them these words. They said, why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we found in the mouths of our sacks, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? And then this is big. Whichever of your servants is found with it shall die. And we also will be my Lord's servants. He said, let it be as you say, he who is found with it shall be my servant and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground and each man opened his sack and he searched beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest. Again, oldest to youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Oh. The one thing <laughs> They didn't want to happen, just happened. What will they do? Because if this had happened 22 years before, they'd have been like, oh, well, we hate that little punk, punk anyway. Peace. But they've changed. So verse 13, then they tore their clothes 
sign of grief. And every man loaded his donkey and they returned to the city. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground. Joseph said to them, what deed is this that you have done? Right, he, he's, he's you know, coming at hard at him. Verse 16, and Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose cup, in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, far be it for me that I should do so. Only the man in whose cup, in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up and peace your father. He's giving him another chance. Hey, here's your chance. Leave him behind. Here's your chance. Leave him abandoned. Then Judah went up to him and said, O Lord, O my Lord, please let your servant speak and let not your anger burn against your servant for you are like Pharaoh himself. And he recounts, here's what's been going on and here's the conversations I've been having with my dad and then here's this thing that happened with you. Verse 30, now therefore as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die and your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Therefore, please let your servant, please let me remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. And Judah, who said, let's make a buck out of Joseph, is now the one who steps forward and says, take me instead of him. Wow. That's the third big lesson, is that's the heart of change. The heart of change is sacrificial love. The heart of change is, is someone saying, hey, take me instead. Right, Reuben, take my two kids. Judah, take me. Judah, who'd only cared about his reputation. Judah, who'd only cared about what the crowd thought. Judah, who was not a person of righteousness, has now experienced a heart change and demonstrates sacrificial love. That was one of the most amazing things as I watched over and over and over the video of, of uh, the assassination attempt yesterday. And, uh, and to see how quickly those Secret Service folks, whew, they just flood. Like they get there. They cut cover, right? Like they become these human shields. It's amazing. I remember years ago talking to this guy who had been in the secret service serving under president Reagan. And he said, what's so hard about, about doing secret service stuff is that you, you have to train yourself to do the opposite of everything that's natural, right? The natural thing is protect yourself. The natural thing is duck and cover for yourself. The unnatural thing is move toward the danger, Use yourself as a sacrificial shield. Judah up to this point has only done what's natural. And now he's doing something supernatural. He's stepping forward in sacrificial love. By the way, that's what all love is. Is sacrificing yourself for the good of someone else. Even when they don't deserve it, they won't repay you. That's the heart of change. Let's continue in chapter 45. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. By the way, let's just pause here, gentlemen. It's okay to cry. Like over and over and over, the only godly guy in Genesis is crying because he's moved with compassion. End of rant. So the Egyptians heard it, the household of Pharaoh heard it, and Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, it's me, ta-da. Is my father still alive? The Hebrew there really means like, is my father, is he actually really doing well? Is he okay? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. You think? Right, see, Joseph had seen, they've changed. It's different. He didn't just want his brothers to bow down to him. He wanted a family to be restored. That's what God's into. 
Verse four, so Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. There are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. This is our final lesson is the author of change, is the sovereign God. And when we talk about God being sovereign, what we mean is that there is nothing that he does not cause or allow. There is not one square inch in the universe over which God does not say, that's mine. And so he doesn't let them off the hook. He says, you sold me, you sold me. But guess what, guys? Even though you sold me, God sent me. God was the one doing this. God was the one preserving. God was the one restoring. God was the one that did this and brought us back together. The reunion continues through the rest of the chapter. Pharaoh throws a big party uh, for them. They have a big meal and then they go back and they get Jacob. He can't believe Joseph's alive and, and they begin to come back and have a restoration as a whole family back in Egypt where they get the best of the land in Egypt. And that's where we'll pick up next week. But if you remember at the beginning of this little mini-series, we said, hey, this thing seems like it's about Joseph. But you know what this story tells us? It's actually about Judah. Because Jesus is not someday called the lion of the tribe of Joseph. He's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. And Judah is unwittingly perhaps, doing the very kind of things that his ultimate descendant, Jesus Christ, would do. Stepping forward and saying, take me instead. Which is why Jesus is known, not just as the lion of Judah, but as the lamb of God, who sacrificially steps forward and takes the sins of the world. Man, that's fun. What a story. What grace. It's never too late to change. Pray with me. God, thank you for amazing grace that saves wretches like Judah and Jacob and Joseph and me and us. God, we pray that we could experience your grace in fresh ways and thank you so much for Jesus the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God. We pray in his name, amen.